everyone. Well, hopefully everything is working as it should be. Uh, if it is, welcome to a Heroes of the Storm Chair League match between the Late Night Fogies and North. We are beginning the best of three on Tomb of the Spider Queen. And uh, the way this starts off on Tomb of the Spider Queen, a lot of people really underestimate how important Tomb of the Spider Queen uh, wave clear is. Uh, so I would expect to see possibly a Gul'dan, uh, something along the lines of a Jaina, some sort of mage that is really good at clearing the waves and the rotations so that the teams can begin to kind of edge forward and get that first web weaver turn in. We see the first ban right now currently being hovered for late night fogies, and they are currently hovering the Sylvanas ban. Sylvanas not as popular on this map as she is on maps such as Battlefield of Eternity and Infernal Shrines, but if you do manage to get the first web weaver turn and you can turn what would ordinarily only be something like uh, a front wall into pretty easily a fort if you play correctly. So I'm expecting here, uh, after the Sylvanas ban, from a response from uh, North to probably be along the lines of a rag ban. Uh, Ragnaros has been really prominent as of late uh, in the competitive scene and the casual scene alike. Um, just has an overwhelming amount of uh, power in the game right now. An incredibly strong solo laner and the ability to just shut down lots of pushes on lots of maps with his heroic um, ability in Sulfurous Smash and also his uh, trait, which allows him to basically single-handedly stop a push. And there it is. There is the Ragnaros ban. A uh, smart ban just trying to make sure that that's not causing a lot of problems on the map for them. So we have our first pick now for the Late Night Fogies. Um, as of late, Malfurion has been a very popular first pick. Uh, supports uh, currently are in kind of an unfortunate state where the really only strong one is Malfurion. Uh, you do see, however, lots of Bright Wings. Karazim is coming back into the meta just a little bit. Ariel is popular on certain maps, but Malfurion fits into basically every team comp. They do decide, however, to go for the first pick, Artanis. Ever since his rework a month or so ago, when it was made so that Artanis can phase Prism during his Blade Dash, he has been really popular as a warrior that can just initiate those fights and get those meaty picks and basically just start a team fight with a kill. If you manage to get a pick on someone in the back line and Artanis can save a lot, stay alive through the enemy burst, it is very easy for him to just run in and blast someone who's not expecting it. And especially if you have the follow-up for it. With the Artanis pick, I would expect to see some burst damage coming through for the late night fogies that would allow them to follow up on those picks or possibly a CC heavy comp, something like an ETC as a second warrior. Uh, speaking of ETC, however, it looks like they will not have that option as or option as North is picking up ETC along with Malfurion. Very strong combo right here. A power slide into a root followed by a face melt can do a lot of uh, CC and just allow your back line to just completely nuke a target if they're just a little bit out of position. So I like this rotation here coming through. Two solid picks, good synergy together, but at the same time it's not really revealing what you're going for. We do see a Jaina and a Tassadar. Very interesting. So the Jaina is not at all surprising. Uh, it has that burst follow-up that I was talking about with Artanis, and as well as the Wave Clear, which is very important on Tomb of the Spider Queen. The Tassadar, however, is really interesting. I was not expecting a Tassadar pick here. Uh, he has not seen as much play um, since his rework. He's still very popular, but he doesn't seem to fill that same niche quite the same way that he used to. So since they did pick up a Tassadar here, unless they decide to solo support Tassadar, which would be a little interesting, I expect to see some sort of auto attack um, uh, heroes to go alongside the Tassadar, something like a Vala, something like a Rain, or even an Illidan to really capitalize on that shielding potential. Uh, what else might we see from them? Uh, the only thing that kind of concerns me about this is if they do decide to go for a second support and a um, auto attack character, then that's going to leave Artanis as a solo warrior, which is a little easier now than it used to be, but it's still not something you oftentimes want to see, except on particular maps. We see the Rhaegar ban coming out uh, from North. A pretty safe ban right there. Rhaegar is one of the other supports that's really popular in the meta right now, uh, just because of the... Uh, Bloodlust buff as well as the general just dredge on supports lately. Until Lucio comes out tomorrow, I believe, there aren't a whole lot of really high tier support. So getting the Rhaegar out of the way, making it so that they can't do like Avala and Tassadar with Rhaegar and Artanis and just be impossible to kill. Uh, that's a pretty smart band coming out from them trying to put the support choke onto... Uh, late night folkies. So we see the Zarya ban currently being hovered by them. Zarya also been a very popular pick as of late, really good at keeping the rest of her teammates alive while also applying a lot of pressure if she does manage to get those energy stacks high. Uh, you really underestimate how much damage a full energy Zarya can do if your uh, front line is just sitting there trying to attack things. So now we're moving into the second pick phase for uh, North. 
Uh, what else do they still need? Well, they still need their damage is the main thing. ETC, Amazing Initiation, great tank. Malfurion, probably the best healer in the game right now. But they need something, obviously, to kill the enemy heroes. So the more obvious picks would be something along the lines of Tychus. Hey, I called it. Tychus has been really popular as of late. Um, I don't think he'll be as useful here, considering they probably won't be going up against a double warrior comp. But he's still a very solid assassin that can do a lot of damage if you just let him sit there and attack you. The Varian pick is actually really interesting. So Varian has seen an immense amount of popularity lately in the competitive scene it kind of started in South Korea and has moved on from there into Europe and also North America and if you go the taunt build it just allows a tremendous amount of lockdown you just jump in with Warbringer taunt them afterwards it's something along the lines of 2.25 seconds straight of someone just being unable to move uh, so the Varian is very interesting. It's not impossible that they might go for one of the other routes, possibly for Colossus, Smash, or Dual Blades. Um, it's not near as popular. That's one of the things that's really cool about Varian that I don't think has uh, really been seen a lot lately, is that if you want to, you can take him and think, oh, he's going to be a tank, and then turn him into a burst assassin, and they'll be none the wiser. So the Varian pick is really interesting there. I'm interested to see whether or not they will go for the taunt build and just go for a lot of blow-up, or if they will try a more assassin-style build on Varian. So our final two picks are coming out for Late Night Fogies, and it's really interesting. So we see Diablo and Brightwing. Uh, Brightwing, I think, is kind of the more interesting pick here. Uh, Diablo, they kind of wanted a front line. I wouldn't normally pick Diablo into Tychus, but since they do have the Artanis Blind and the additional Tassadar Shields, they might be able to get away with it. Um, Brightwing is not as strong on this map as she is on others. So Brightwing is good in four-man rotations because of just that constant healing and the additional CC from the Polymorph. Um, but with the... Map being as small as it is, Tomb of the Spider Queen being, the, if not the smallest, one of the smallest maps in the game, I don't know that they will get a whole lot of passive value uh, from Brightwing's global power. Uh, and I guess what they might be trying to do here is also using Brightwing in the solo lane, possibly. Brightwing being an okay solo laner because of all that self-sustain. But it's definitely an interesting choice. Uh, the only thing about this team comp is it does kind of leave their damage. Artanis obviously can tech more into damage, and Diablo does a lot of damage for being a tank, but they don't have a traditional sustained damage carry like a Vala or a Raynor. And we see our final pick coming out from North, which is going to be the Kael'thas. This definitely makes me think that we're going to see um, the Taunt variant come out, since they already have two backline assassins, and that amount of uh, damage that you can do if you power slide, root, Warbringer, Taunt, they're just standing still forever, Tychus hammering away with his minigun, and then Kael'thas runs in with a flame strike, and that person's just dead. So the Kael'thas, I think, is a strong pick here. Um, looking at these two comps, I think that both of them are really focused on just blowing one person up. Uh, we see for Late Night Fogies, you have the Diablo Displacement, the Artanis Displacement, the Brightwing Polymorph, and the Jaina Burst are all just about getting that swap, Diablo throwing someone over, pawing them so they can't get away and having Jaina nuke him. But by the same metric, we have North over here with the Malfurion Root, the ETC Power Slide, all of the Kael'thas Burst, the Varian Lockdown, and the Tychus Damage. Both of the teams are really trying to do the same thing. They're trying to find one person and just absolutely obliterate them before the rest of the team can react. Uh, the one thing I'm a little concerned about coming from Late Night Fogies is whether or not Brightwing decides to go with Clint. So looking at this comp, there's a lot of lockdown, and most of it is pretty easy to predict. It's fairly easy to see when someone's got Power Slide on that there's going to be a Varian follow-up or an uh, Malfurion follow-up. Um, so I would expect Brightwing to be forced to go into cleanse here, but at the same time, they could decide to just risk it and say, oh, no, we'll get the initiation, we don't need the cleanse. So we see both teams now are currently rotating towards the mid lane, going for a little early game skirmish, as is customary. I remember to press the Z button, so uh, props to me there. But we are just seeing a lot of positioning here, neither team really going too aggressive, they don't want to risk uh, losing a life this early and losing XP, especially North considering they have Varian, who's basically just Olaf until level 10. Uh, we see Tychus has already rotated down to the bot lane, going ahead and starting to soak and push the lane. Uh, I'm curious who they will send the Late Night Fogies down to deal with the Tychus, and it does look like it will actually be Artanis in the solo lane. Artanis not the strongest solo laner, uh, but he is usually able to hold his own. Uh, as long as he's careful with his health management, he shouldn't have too much of a problem with Tychus. So, right now, not a whole lot of action. Uh, 
but as we can see, as I mentioned earlier, just a lot of back and forth here. Both teams just kind of soaking. It looks like late night fogies are a little bit ahead on the rotation, uh, thanks largely to Jaina's wave clear, I would imagine. But Kelvoss's wave clear is nothing to sneeze at either. The only thing is Kelvoss does need to be careful if he wants to start stacking his convection. Kelvoss, as I said, that is getting flipped by Diablo, taking a lot of damage. Malfurion is able to get the heal on him and keep him alive. A good initiation attempt there from late night fogies, but unfortunately for them, the support was close enough that he was able to save Kael'thas. Uh, meanwhile, bot lane, Artanis has been forced to tap the well. Tychus can be a bit of a lane bully if he's crazy play strong. Diablo a little bit out of position, but manages to headbutt the variant back into the team. A lot of damage going down on everybody. Both of the supports right now just doing a very good job of keeping them up. Uh, I don't really think we're going to see a lot of kills here until the teams manage to hit 10 and really hit that CC spike, where they're just absolutely railing people with the apocalypse, with the taunt, until one person just can't move until they're dead. Because both teams have pretty strong supports, and especially when you consider Late Night Fogies has two with uh, Brightwing and Tassadar. I don't expect to see a kill until someone can just be locked down until they're dead. Just looking back bot lane real quick, just a little more. This is basically what we're going to see the entire bot lane until something, someone decides to rotate down. They're just been going back and forth. ETC getting a little caught out of position, does manage to power slide away. Malfurion once again having his back, just keeping that health high. Uh, and this is kind of the problem with having a double support comp. It's not that it's bad, it's just that you usually end up sacrificing some damage for it. So although it's going to be really hard to kill them, it's also going to be hard for them to get a kill, unless they do manage to just get a full to zero burst on the switch with Jaina. Which will be progressively more difficult as ETC gets more talents, and Varian, if he does decide to go taunt, takes that route, and they will just be hard to get past. Uh, we see right now, it looks like, uh, despite the game being almost entirely even on XP, a very small advantage for late night fogies, they have a pretty substantial lead in gems, which is just due to their uh, a little bit faster rotations, doing a better job of wave clearing and picking up the gems. So, unless Diablo dies here, uh, which looks like he's going to make it out, Tassadar did manage to put the shield on him, but uh, Jaina does not get caught by Kael'thas' stun. So it looks like the first turnover will very likely go over to Late Night Fogies, which will be an opportunity for them to seize control of the game. Uh, onto the Spider Queen, getting the first turn in doesn't usually mean that you win the game. It can be a pretty good indicator of which team's doing a better job, but as I say that, a good initiation coming in from ETC, but this is this Diablo pick is actually working out a lot better than I thought it would. Because anytime ETC or someone slides past Diablo to initiate, he can just power slide them and actually knock them back into his team. So uh, I'm a little concerned about how it'll take uh, how it'll take over in the late game, especially now that Tychus does have his in the rhythm. We we'll begin to put a lot of pressure onto Diablo. I like how it's working in the early game. I think Diablo was, a, in a weird way, a good counter pick for ETC. As I say that, though, Diablo getting caught out. A lot of lockdown coming down from ETC and Barry and Jaina is there to slow the two of them, and they don't have a lot of damage, so ETC is able to walk out. Uh, a lot of damage going down with Barry and though good CC coming from Jaina and Tassadar. But, this being as a small map as it is, it's very easy to respond to rotations, and Malfurion is there to help save the day. ETC gets a huge gym turn in, which makes them only three away. Kael'thas right now could go and turn in if he wanted to. And it was looking like an early turn in for the late night fogies might actually be a turn in for North. We see it coming in now, it doesn't look like they have vision, they are not going to get the interrupt. And the first web leader of the game does go over to North. Diablo a little too far up, taking a lot of damage. CC from ETC. Is the power slide coming? It doesn't look like it is. Diablo does manage to get away with the Rackham Speed boost. Kael'thas getting in some nice poke here. Uh, so, not as much of a travesty for late night fogies as it could have been. Uh, but they do manage to get, North does manage to get the first turn in. Diablo looks like he's been pushed back just a little bit, probably playing it safe, doesn't want to overextend too much knowing that Artanis has no escapes. So we will see Late Night Fogies now trying to clear the slow the waves. Uh, Nightwing getting caught by the power slide, followed by the Warbreaker, taking a lot of damage, and the first kill of the game does go over to North. That is just unfortunate for them. Diablo has had to back for help, so he was not there to help save the Brightwing. And unfortunately, Brightman cannot cleanse herself. Amazing split coming from Diablo. Uh, unfortunately, Malfurion is still within range to get the heal thanks to that Alune's Grace at level 4. And despite closing over the wall, they were not able to get the kill. Brightman jumping in with his global. Uh, looks like that they're going to basically only lose one life in a fort here. That's not too bad. The question is how they fare in the other lanes. Looks like somebody, a oh, little bit of a skirmish near top lane in between the two lanes. Uh, applying damage to this uh, web weaver. Oh, 
almost dead. It looks like he will get the middle front wall as well, but that they will be able to stop it before the keep is taking. Diablo taking a lot of damage from Jerry and Tychus, uh, but not really any threat to getting destroyed. Uh, looks like the most damage was actually suffered bot lane, uh, with Artanis having to push against the Webweaver by himself and not having any ranged clear, is only able to clear the Webweavers when it's safe and when the Webweavers are nice and close, which usually means they'll be able to get some damage. Now it looks like that the late night Kogis are posturing for a turn in of their own. Morph does not want to let them have it. They're all conglomerating here, looking for ways to interrupt this. Artanis looks like he went and turned in bot lane, but it was not enough gems. Uh, Tassadar or Jaina 1 will have to turn in in order for this Webweaver to go through. They're probably going to have to try to split uh, the two of the characters because with Varian, Pope, Malfurion, Moonfires, Kael'thas, or Kael'thas Flame Strikes, Norp is not going to let them just stand there and turn in. And no matter how much they want to. So they are probably going to have to split their efforts if they want to do so, and they'll have to do it fast. But as you can see up here in the top north is pretty quickly approaching level 10, and if they manage to hit that, it will be a lot more difficult for Late Night Focus to turn in. Uh, looks like they are going now for the bot one instead, but they have been spotted by the minions. Uh, good lines mod coming in from Varian. Uh, Tychus barely gets the interrupt from the bot lane. And Tim is almost achieved, and now we will finally see whether or not Varian is going the Warbringer build, or not, not Warbringer, the Taunt build. Uh, based on his talent choices, I think that's pretty obvious. Warbringer Alliance mod victory rush for the Taunt talent, and he does decide to go with it. So now, uh, Late Night Focus has to be really careful, because as we can see here, uh, with uh, just a Varian by himself can get a lot of initiation. ETC were there, uh, Brighton would have almost definitely been dead. Uh, looks like that they are committed to pushing this bot lane, at least to some degree. Uh, Tychus pushing really far up in the Odin, putting pressure on that fort, trying to knock it down. Uh, meanwhile, we see that Late Night Focus is really struggling for just what to do here. They know they want to turn in, they know they want to get the Web Weavers, but no matter where they go, they just can't seem to do it. Uh, maybe they're looking for a fight, knowing that Odin is down. We see the Pulse, uh, Suppression Pulse coming in from Arcanus. Uh, maybe a little bit early, there was not quite an initiation from Narf there. Oh, hey, wow, that was a good uh, keep followed by Mushkid. Diablo taking a lot of damage, getting melted down by the Tychus. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened there. I don't know. Oh, uh, wow, as I was not expecting the Archon to come through from Tassadar. They do manage to get a kill uh, on the Tychus, but it looks like Tassadar goes down as well. That's currently a two-for-one trade in favor of North, but at the same time, Late Night Fogies did manage to turn in gems during all of that chaos, so although they might be a little bit down on experience, this is the opportunity that they have to try to push this back. And what I was talking about earlier, which was really interesting, is that we saw the Artanis jump in, and it looked like he was probably trying to get a swap, but he inadvertently wound up instead blocking uh, Kael'thas' E from hitting the Diablo. So it's really interesting there. I don't know if, uh, I think that was probably just an accident on the part of the two teams. You see Varian going really deep here, trying to get on Brightwing. Artanis was predicting a juke from the Varian. The Varian walked right past the Phase Prism. It looks like that North is doing a really good job here of clearing out these Weavers. Uh, Late Night Fogies does manage to get the front top wall, and it looks like the front bottom wall as well. That could really help to even out the EXP. As you can see, if you look at the top right here, it's almost a huge uh, Kael'thas taking a lot of damage from Artanis. Artanis doing his best. He might have a little too far. Uh, I can't help but think that Artanis was being a little too overzealous. And he did have 40 gems. I understood what he was trying to go for with the swap, but once you miss the swap, you really can't afford to stay in any longer, uh, lest you end up kind of baiting your team and initiating under fort. Tassar taking a lot of damage. Brightwing doing a good job there, blink really healing in to make sure that Tassar doesn't die and risk losing gems. Uh, so right now, it looks like that North is going in for their own turn and immediately afterward. Good suppression pulse coming in from Artanis to delay them just a little bit until he can get back. Uh, something I'm kind of noticing is that it looks like Late Night Fogies uh, has just a little bit less interruption ability than North does, despite the fact that they have Tassadar, who can use his Psionic Storm, and Jaina, who has her Frostbolt Pope. Um, they haven't been quite as effective at stopping North from turning in. As I say that, however, Diablo gets a big 24 gem turn in that actually puts them a little ahead on the board of gems. That being said, North has enough to turn in themselves. Uh, looks like there might be a fight breaking out top lane. Currently, Tychus is down taking the Bruiser camp. So if Late Night Focus initiated this now, this is the best chance. Three Frost coming out only catches Mount Fury. He uses the Ice Block, but he's still in a lot of trouble. Amazing four-man monster coming in from ETC. 
Jaina, however, still manages to get the kill on Kael'thas. Brightling just barely survives, despite an amazing initiation that Jaina being alive and able to press the back lane means that they are currently taking a beating. As I said that, however, Artanis goes down, but ETC does as well. Brightwing, this is a scattered fight right here. Jaina still full health. Brightwing jumping to Jaina to stay alive. Diablo coming around to help heal for his team. Tychus managing to push out Tassadar. It is a two for two trade. Or may have been a 1 for 2 trade, actually. It was only the Artanis that looks like he died for late night fogies, while ETC and Kel'Thas both went down for North. Um, despite this, however, we have the Bruisers pushing in, so even though that was a good fight for late night fogies, not a whole lot came out of it. But it looks like Diablo's actually one gym shy of being able to turn in here. Will he get it or will Malfurion come down to stop him? Tyke is currently turning in gyms of his own. Another 15 going in. Varian probably going to look for the Lion's Maw, but Brightwing does manage to get the turn in. And this is exactly what Late Night Focus needed. Uh, they were really kind of struggling for a way to get back on the map, but now that they've managed to get two turn ins in a row, um, that will help them push the bot lane, which is currently pressing on the court, and give them an opportunity to maybe take a fort of their own if they manage to get another good fight. The only problem right now is that Archon and Apoc are both still down for a while. Varian stepped a little far forward. Prism coming in from Arcanus, but once again, not making contact. It looks like they are going to posture to push down this middle lane uh, while bot lane is being cleared by the web weaver. Top lane is pushing itself. Uh, I don't want to move to it because we see a fight coming in here. Actually, no, Tychus does make the Doctor Ring of Frost. Varian being a little far out. He has a large health pool with ETC in the back line there. It looks like they will be able to save him. Uh, I do want to mention, I don't want to switch to it in case something happens, but if you look at the minimap in bot lane, you, you see that the fort almost got knocked down by North's minions alone. So that's something they have to really look out for. That fort could fall over at a moment's notice and could put North ahead on the board. Now, when you see a fight here coming in, Apoc is now available as is Archon. Luna Frog cover is not there. Uh, Phase Prism missed once again from the toe on Artanis. Now he's going for some pretty, uh, what would be pretty important swaps, but unfortunately he's just, he's just shy. Uh, looks like Diablo's getting initiated on his team coming from Brightwing, however, Jaina is a little far forward, about to get initiated on by the ETC two-man mosh pit. That has got to be the backline dead. Oh, I speak a little too soon, but actually I don't. A good Twilight Dream coming in from Malfurion. It looked like they might have been able to get away, but unfortunately for them, Malfurion is there. And Tastar is going down as well. It looks like that North is not going to let this go anytime soon, despite the fact that the bot web Weaver has pushed through their fourth. They're going to fight for a fort of their own. Uh, not a single one of their members has died yet. Kael'thas getting a little bit low, but with Alfieri in the back line, not a whole lot of mana, but enough to probably help them push through this fort with the medium weight being there. Uh, so a good fight coming through from both teams. It does look like in the very end that Jaina, well, in a good flanking position, which is really required if you're going to play Jaina. Uh, unfortunately for them, when the rest of the team got away, Jaina was not in a position where she could escape the well as you guys initiation. And although they almost got out of it, Malfurion was able to finish the deal with Twilight Dream. Uh, right now, I'm going to check this real quick. I don't know exactly what the mechanics of this are, but okay. Uh, actually, Kael'thas, I was thinking that might be time that his convection stacks were completed. I guess I missed a death on him because he is not really even close right now. Uh, so it was something I thought that Late Night Fogies might need to be worrying about. But it looks like that they will be fine on that front, not having to worry about a lot of Kael'thas damage just yet. While I was saying that, you'll notice that boss was taken. Um, it, late Night Fogies decided not to contest, worried about taking the fight when they were down a talent tier. And the fort's already dead, so they have plenty of latitude here to try to clear it. However, it may have been that the boss was merely a distraction because we see that North has gone and decided to turn in Red Weavers while Late Night Fogies was busy killing the boss. And this is also serving to really push the wave up. So if I were Late Night Fogies right here, I would either have to A, push out this wave, maybe have one person do it, but you also notice that North is really hard pushing this fort right here. They might even be able to take it before the Web Weaver gets here. So while I understand the call to try to clear that wave so that the Web Weaver doesn't push as far, when you lose a fort in the process, you have a bit of a problem. Um, we do see a pause coming out. Um, one of the players appears to be having connection difficulties. Um, I will give them... Oh, <laughs> lag F issues. Well, Zuna, Zuna is with us, it would seem. So hopefully in just a few minutes he will be able to reconnect. Um, in the meantime, we will just stare at this pretty screen. Give me just a moment to make sure all of the things stream side look um, a okay, and then I will talk a little bit about the game so far. All right, all of the stream side stuff looks fine. Um, so I'm a little concerned about the disconnecting. Um, we'll give them a few minutes. I don't know the exact protocol on this. So we'll just play it by ear until we have an idea of what's going on. Uh, but the game so far, so if you look at the board right now, you can see that it definitely appears to be in favor 
of North. Um, they are, have a minor XP lead, but it's not like so much that it's negligible, but it's certainly noticeable. And they are currently up a uh, fort. And um, honestly, you could probably say they're up uh, closer to two forts, as you can see that the uh, fort for uh, Late Night Fogies in the bottom left is uh, basically dead. Uh, they could breathe on it, and it would pretty much fall over. Uh, but we also have web weavers pushing in top and mid. I don't know. Unfortunately, I cannot move the map around when uh, we are paused. But I, it looks like Jaina is going to try to solo clear that uh, web weaver. And while the other, I guess, four of them uh, would be Tassadar, Brightwing, Artanis, and Diablo try to stall this push as long as possible. Uh, I'm... Skeptical that they'll be able to do so effectively, just in the sense that without the ranged uh, AoE of Jaina's Blizzard, it will be very hard to clear both the Wave and the Web Weaver. So I would definitely expect at least Front Wall to go down here. Because if someone like Artanis or Diablo steps a little too far forward, they're really going to be in trouble if they get followed through by a bunch of CC. So this is a little subpar that we don't seem to know where Big Beard is right now. Uh, I am curious. Hmm. This is not great. Well, for the time being, uh, I suppose I will switch over to a quick just intermission screen until we can figure out what exactly is going on, what the protocol is. Uh, so please stay tuned uh, for the time being, especially the three of you in chat who may or not be here just because you know me. I appreciate you showing up. And we will hopefully get back as soon as possible. Alrighty, it looks like we are ready to get back into the game. So, three. Actually, hold on. What's the pause break key? Hold on. What is the unpause button? 
In case, in case those of you who are in the stream aren't aware, this is a... Uh, I am relatively new to this whole shindig, so... You'll have to bear with me just a little bit. Alright. Three. Two. One. Uh, oh god. This isn't what I wanted. Press the pause break key to resume. Oh god. Press the pause break key. I pressed escape and it did, didn't work. Hit resume. There's a resume button. Escape. Return to game. Oh! I found it. I am the greatest. Three, two, one. All right, there we go. I am so good at this. Isn't it wonderful? Um, anyway... Uh, it looks like uh, we have <laughs> managed to fix the internet problems for the time being. If only the caster was, uh, <laughs> if only the caster was uh, had any idea what he was doing. This would be fantastic. So anyway, we see the web weavers beginning to push for north. Uh, the one top lane will probably die before it even hits the keep wall. They managed to clear up the mid one as well, and the bot one is already dead. So uh, a lot less damage being done here than I initially predicted. My guess would be that to some degree, but uh, the pause may have. Uh, limited the ability for the mid web weaver to catch them off guard as it were that being said the bot web weaver pretty low health but pushing as well and it does look like they're going to try to force some damage on this front wall uh one of the towers already almost getting entirely destroyed but before even the wave gets here i might just expect to see a fight break right out here from little and the opera looking for initiation uh, maybe the shadow charge might be a little too far in good kills coming from bright wing good apoc hits Four people combined with the ring. A lot of damage going down to the back line. ETC is dead. Brightwing Hover is also low. Mal picking a lot of damage from Pascal and Arcanus. Diablo charging in, getting the clip on Varian. Uh, looks like Malfurion may get away. Varian also, but no, the Psy Storm and the auto attack from Tassadar are enough to stop them. Really good initiation here coming in from the late night bogeys. Uh, I don't know exactly if you saw it, there's a four-man APOC followed by a multi-man ring just putting a lot of damage down onto North. Uh, although Diablo was a little far forward, uh, Brightwing and Tassar were both there to keep him alive, and what looked like a risky initiation actually worked out very well for late night fogies. And basically saved um, most damage to the keep. They did manage to get that tower right there, uh, but that prevents... Uh, North from really running away with the game at this point. This is it's kind of a race of 20, despite both teams being a few levels away. Uh, so right now, if we look at the gym count, we notice that neither team is particularly close. Uh, the closest one is Late Night Fogies, currently being 20 gyms away from a turn-in of their own. Uh, so we're going to see what I imagine is a lot of posturing, a lot of rotations, trying to get these gyms, and both teams probably looking for picks. Uh, we see the bot siege being taken by Late Night Fogies, which is beginning to slowly push down the lane, but unfortunately for them, uh, North is not going to let that get any free value as multiple members go down to clear it and de-push the wave. Uh, Barry, I'm a little curious uh, about what is going on right here, because it looks like they are posturing for possibly some sort of blow-up. But I'm... Oh, there we go. Uh, I don't know. I guess they were just waiting to see whether or not they were coming up so they could run up and grab that fort once they knew where everyone was. So I guess that's a fair play. I'm just a little bit confused about the posturing around here because I don't know if they're going to get a whole lot done considering neither team has enough gems to turn in. So right now, it looks like we see the Varian is currently hiding in the bush, getting revealed by Tassadar. Diablo does go in, but is unable to follow up on his keep. Uh, Tychus is odin up. It looks like they're going to try for an initiation, but Late Night Fogey sniffs it out and decides just to back away. Uh, this will be a little too soon. Diablo wins for a turn, and actually Varian is chasing after him. Uh, it looks like he's probably going to be able to get a taunt here. Oh, he's backing out. It looks like neither team really wants to take this fight just quite yet. We notice that the XP values are almost entirely equal. Uh, so it really is anybody's game at this point. Um, I will say that North is up by a fort, but at this point that really doesn't mean a whole lot. That could go down very quickly. It really only helps them if Late Night Fogies gets another web weaver wave. It's just getting it. initiated from Varian. Oh, a good double stop in the back line from Arcanus, followed by an Apoc Twilight Dream. Ring of Frost, all of the ultimates coming out. Everybody is just dying. The first damage from Jaina, destroying everything. Artanis jumping in on the back line. Varian going down as well. That was an amazing swap. 
He's been having some difficulty with it all game, but Poe finally got that swap that just mm, that makes you want to play Artanis, getting the double swap on Malfurion and Kael'thas, the two squishiest targets. Jaina with the Ring of Frost, with the Apoc from Diablo just completely blowing them up, not able to move, taking a lot of damage. That was the exact fight that Late Night Fogies needed to really get ahead on this. You'll notice that also less than hit 20. They're currently working on the boss. Um, North will have respawned by the time uh, the boss makes it to their keep wall. Well, maybe not their keep wall, but by the time it's hammering down their keep, boss moves pretty slowly. Um, so I would imagine that they would be able to do so. But we also see a web weaver. This could very well be game. A late night fogey is basically getting the perfect storm, wiping four members of the enemy team, getting them level 20, grabbing the boss, turning in the web weaver's top keep already open. Like, it. Oh goodness, this, okay, whew, for a minute there that was going to be game. Trying to defend that 5v4 could have been really dangerous without having the tie get to help poke it away. Uh, they do really need to be careful here because North does not have the leisure of being able to soak 20 before the fight starts. It does look like Late Night Fogies is being cautious. They are concerned about uh, initiating without all the ultimates up. We'll see that the uh, uh, Diablo's Apoc and Tathadar's Archon are just a few seconds off cooldown. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what they're doing for here. They're just kind of standing around, like, just waiting for the initiation, maybe waiting for the wave. At the same time, they could also just be waiting for them to have to make a decision. We see that the keep is almost dead. Just a little bit of focus. Ionic Storm from Tathadar, or whatever that was. I guess Brightwing got it when I wasn't looking. Uh, can knock it down. At the same time, uh, we see the Web Weavers managing to knock down the Bot Keep as well. Although they didn't go to end the game, this is still very good for... Oh, can we see another swap coming in? No, Tiger does manage to dodge out of the way. Uh, but it looks like that uh, Late Night Fogies isn't done. They want all three keeps. We see that the Web Weaver is getting cleared out, so they don't have a lot else to stand on. They are going to decide to go away. Uh, Diablo getting uh, taunted and pulled a little bit far back, but the rest of the team is not there to capitalize. So, from this point, uh, what you have to remember on Tomb of the Spider Queen is that the only real win conditions are boss, web weavers, and killing everyone on the enemy team. And none of those things are particularly easy to do when boss is currently on cooldown, your team doesn't have enough gems, and the enemy team is all five together on the other end of the map. So although, uh, with two keeps ahead, uh, Late Night Fogies has really taken a lead here, um, it's still very easily anyone's game. Both teams have level 20. Uh, ultimates are up for both sides with the exception of Suppression Pulse for Arcanus. So, and neither team, with Boss being down and neither team having enough gems for Web Weavers, uh, the only thing that really is going for Late Night Fogies is that they basically have Top and Bot Wave automatically pushing because of the Catapults. So North is going to have to respond to that. And it looks like the way they're responding, uh, for a second it looked like they were going to try and gank that Tassadar, or not that Tassadar, that Kaikis. But they decide just to back off instead. Um, since we have reached, oh, I may have switched soon, we might have a situation here. Uh, Kaikis is up top, so if they're going to do it, now is the time. Swap coming in, uh, but ETC is able to just power slide out. Uh, Flynn's coming through to save Artan. It's probably a little bit necessary, but I do not know if they had vision on Varian, so that may have just been the safe play for the Brightwing to make sure that Artanis didn't get initiated on. Uh, so a good attempt there, but unfortunately ETC is going to be one of the hardest people to catch with a swap considering he can just face melt and then power slide out. Uh, so really quickly, let's just take a look at some of the talents just to see if everything looks as expected uh, for the comps. Uh, so Jaina is going a pretty traditional frost build, uh, frost bolt build here uh, with Ring of the Frost and Massive Initiation and Ice Barrier to help keep herself alive. Nothing too surprising. Uh, Tassadar build. Tassadar actually decided to go with PW. Um, most of the pros have been running the more shield-oriented build, but a lot of them say that the Psionic Storm build might actually be good on particular maps. I don't know if this is one of those maps, but uh, I'm, I'm very I'm interested to see how well it's been doing so far. I'm actually going to hopefully nothing important happen. Let me check the stats real quick. Yeah, if you, if you saw that number, oh wow, a good spot coming from Arcanus. He's taking a lot of punishment out of Arcanus. Ring of Frost catches only ETC, but that may be enough. It's taking a lot of damage. Varian almost dead as well. Decides to go back in and try to help supply his team. It does look like it was enough for them to kill Artanis. Although it was a two-for-one trade, Diablo is really low. And they're being forced to back out. Oh, man. Tassadar may have taken the wrong path there. Getting absolutely destroyed by Tychus and the big red button. 
<clears throat> what looked like was a good initiation for late night fogies has actually turned around for North quite a bit. Just the amount of pressure coming in from Tychus, and this will, this is actually really big for North, because this is a tournament. The only thing they have to worry about is if you look here, these catapults are currently pelting the core. They should have time. I saw Tychus recalling, Malfurion recalling as well. So this shouldn't actually be able to get it, but they do need to be careful because it is taking a lot of damage. Oh wow, it's getting all the way down 7%. A suppression pulse, if he were up, would not actually be enough to take it, but that was a very risky choice from North right there, letting the core get that low. I don't think they realized exactly how many minions were pushing in on their base. Otherwise, they might not have pursued it as far. And um, really, the rest of the team, I guess they were there to protect Tychus since he had so many games. But after they managed to get the kill on Tassadar and scare off the rest of the team, they really should have that to help prevent some of that damage because now it would be possible for late night fogies to just ignore basically anything that north is doing and run in and take the core uh, even with the shield up that's only 37 percent that can be pretty easily done probably by artanis alone considering his I mean, shield capacity. um so while they're posturing here i want to get back to the talent builds real quick to see if there's anything out of the ordinary um, as i mentioned earlier we see the w build coming out from tassadar why he has such high um, siege damage here, almost double that of Jane, which is really impressive. So I actually think that's a really smart choice from the Tassar on the side of the way on this map. Um, Artanis going kind of a huge and amateur opponent is a really interesting choice, um, considering that the mercs on this a map aren't particularly important, and that having it doesn't really help your wave clear all that much. So if I were Artanis, I would have gone for a season mark, especially considering they already have a Diablo. Speaking of Diablo getting initiated on by Barry and NBC, EPC can be good knock on driving, but once again, Tassadar and Jaina are in the back, ready to dish out damage, but my goodness, the Tychus damage at this point in the game, I never realized how much damage Tychus does. Like, I always knew that the pros preferred Big Red Button because of the damage that it allows, but my goodness, seeing it in action this close, it really is amazing, just the way it spreads through the back. That was another instance where, oh goodness gracious, yeah, Tassadar... Gotta be a little more careful. I know you've got that um, dimensional shift, but Tychus is going to destroy you if you let him. Um, but that was another fight, which looked like a good initiation on Diablo, which got turned around because of Jaina and Cassadar, as well as the Clinton from Bradley, but got turned around again because of Tychus just pummeling through in the back line. Uh, for those of you who have no idea what's going on in the chat, uh, namely my friends, uh, Big Red Button is an upgrade to Tychus's uh, heroic ability which makes his big giant mech last longer and launch a nuclear missile that lands in the area when he uses one of his abilities a few seconds later. And it does a lot of damage, uh, which is why we keep seeing the back line of uh, Late Night Fogies just getting completely eviscerated. Uh, despite the fact that that fight was really in favor of North, we see again that this constant pressure from the Catapult's top lane, the pressure from the Catapult's bot lane, the l fact that the core is only 7%, uh, is really making it hard for North to do anything meaningful unless they get a really clean wipe. Like, being up a kill or two at this point in the game doesn't really matter. If you do a two for one, it can still be a problem. You may not have what it needs to score when you have uh, Adas pushing on your lane. Uh, so, oh, what do we see here? It looks like Late Night Fogies is going for it. A uh, North doesn't seem to know. Tychus is going back, but Kael'thas and Malph are walking. EDC going back as well. Varian just now heading back. I think they're going to be too late. Martanus has a lot of healing. Gravel has a lot of health. Storm 2 coming in from right wing. That was a smart play coming in from Late Night Fogies. And they just ran in there, snuck through the bot lane while North was concerned that they might be posturing for the boss and just taking that core. A good play coming in really from both teams. That could have been anybody's game. That was a really well-fought match, or game rather, on Tomb of the Spider Queen. I was uh, impressed by it. Neither team gave up, and both teams had a good chance. Late Night Fogies definitely took a lead when they managed to get double keep off of a Web Weaver Lave, but North never gave up and had a couple good fights afterward. It was just by that point, trying to win with a 7% core would just really put them in a position where they didn't have a means to really ever apply pressure because if they went top to get boss they sneak through bot to get it if they go bot to defend they can just sneak through top and get boss instead so it looks like the second game is going to be Dragonshire. um if those of you in the audience will give me just a moment i am going to go about setting up the lobby so that we can get into game two so i will be right back
Alrighty then. We are getting into the second game between Late Night Fokies and North in the Chair League Best of Three Division Three match. So I will go ahead and start this up. As you can see, this game is happening on Dragonshire. Late Night Fogey is currently up one to zero, um, doing an amazing job of sneaking the court the last minute after it had been weared down by the catapults from two fallen keeps. So this time, the first pick is going over to North. Uh, I want to talk briefly about Dragonshire because it's most certainly my least favorite map. Um, not, to, not to cast, but just to play on, uh, because Dragonshire is really interesting. Because in order to get the objective, the Dragon Knight, which is already considered to be one of the weaker objectives in the game, you have to hold three points at the same time. You have to have top lane shrine, bottom lane shrine, and also have a person who can channel uninterrupted the middle lane. And so it really requires a lot of coordination and is antithetical to kind of the traditional like, oh man, we're going to go run around and kill everybody with five guys. You really can't afford to do that. Because uh, if you do, the other team can just run around uh, soaking more than you and just getting a shrine, just playing cat and mouse. You go five people to the box shrine, they send one guy to the top shrine and the other people soak lanes. You send five guys to the top shrine, so on and so forth. So it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out. We see that North does not want to deal with Tassadar and that the Late Night Fogies is unwilling to give Artanis over to North. Uh, we will note that this does leave uh, multiple really powerful heroes on this map uh, open. Uh, that leaves Ragnaros open, really popular right now. Dehaka, who I've not seen a lot of recently, but is still considered a very strong pick on maps like this. It looks like they do decide to go with the Ragnaros. Um, if I recall correctly, this is actually one of Ragnaros's higher win rate maps. Uh, so I'm curious to see... I, I will have to double check my statistics, which I'll do at a later point. Uh, but if I recall correctly, that had to deal also largely with the fact that the Dragon Knight um, already does not do an excellent job of taking structures early game and Ragnaros just completely shuts that down uh, with Molten Core. Uh, so we have the picks now coming in from Late Night Fogies. Uh, once again, I would possibly expect an early Malfurion pick just to lock that down. Not really reason not to. I am a prophet. Uh, and possibly, hey, there's the Dehaka pick. I really hope you guys aren't listening in on this and uh, taking my advice. That would be very uh, unsportsmanlike of you. Uh, but if, if not, uh, I like the pick. Uh, Dehaka uh, doing a, does a lot on this map. Um, he's not the greatest against laning against Ragnaros if they do decide to send Ragnaros top lane, uh, but his ability to jump from shrine to shrine, if need be, a cat bot, sh a cat bot shrine jump to top, uh, maybe all the enemies mid lane trying to take the Dragon Knight, you just jump to a shrine and prevent that from happening. And also his ability is currently, if not the strongest solo laner, one of the strongest solo laners in the game, uh, taking primal aggression at level 1. just enables him to really not usually get kills, but the way I've seen Dehaka used effectively in competitive play is just by pushing in wave after wave after wave and just not allowing the opponent to do anything, really. Uh, so we see Falstad and ETC coming in from uh, North. I really like the ETC pick. The ETC play last game was very solid. I'm glad to see that again coming through from them. They realized that ETC wasn't the problem. Um, they just may have been um, caught a little off guard by some of the things. They're willing to try that strategy again. And we see Falstad. Uh, I personally am not a huge fan of Falstad. Um, once again, they might they might just be taking Falstad to help counter the global presence of Dehaka, in which case it's not a bad choice if they don't want right wing. Uh, so Falstad, an interesting pick coming through. We'll see what build they decide to go with, whether or not they go with an auto-attacking build or the more mage stab with gathering power. Uh, the Rhaegar ban, uh, outside of Malfurion, Rhaegar is probably the most popular support right now, so they decide to just knock that out of the way. They don't want to deal with it. And the Varian ban. Um, it is kind of humorous that the team seem to be banning uh, the own characters that they played because they don't want the other team to get it. Late Night Fogies uh, banned Artanis because they don't want to play against it even though they used it last game, and North is banning Varian even though they used it last game. Just trying to make sure that uh, they recognize that the characters are powerful, kind of independent of who's playing them. So they're just trying to take those off of the table. So currently, once again, we see a tank and a support pick coming in from Late Night Fogies. The question is, how are they going to follow that up? Um, Dehaka is able to solo tank, but he is not the strongest by any means, so I would anticipate uh, seeing them pick up another uh, tank, possibly. Um, something like a Muradin, uh, maybe a Diablo again. That worked out fairly well for them last time, although I would be a little concerned about doing so. Hey, there's the Diablo again. Diablo play was also very solid. Um, the only reason I would be a little hesitant about that is that Tychus was a very powerful force on um, uh, North's team uh, last game, 
and it is still open. They could pick it alongside of a support. Oh, because I what I probably expect to happen here. It does look like the teams kind of are well, at least late night focus is at least somewhat reliant on some comfort picks. Uh, we see them taking the Diablo again. Uh, and the Jaina again, uh, my best guess is because they just really like those characters, they feel comfortable on them, and that they're willing to just do those same things again. They are, albeit, kind of adapting a little bit. They're taking Malfurion since he was available, going for Dehaka for the global presence. Uh, I'm not saying that the Diablo and Jaina picks were bad, it is just interesting that they do decide to go for the same thing again, despite the fact that Tychus is still up. And I wonder if they will possibly, even though Tassadar is banned, what they will pick up for their last... Uh, pick if they will go for a range DPS this time, uh, if they'll go for maybe a really solid front line, a Karazim. Now, I mentioned earlier that Karazim has been growing in popularity as of late, um, but I usually don't, I never expect it, I guess is the best way to see it. I always know it's there, but I'm never like, oh, this is where you go, Karazim. Um, just because it's really, his place in the meta is somewhat unclear. He's mainly seen in the Korean scene just because of how powerful, like, a Korean level Divine Palm can be. And also his ability to be played as an assassin as well as a support while still maintaining good healing numbers. So the composition for North here is really interesting. The Zera tool is also something I was not quite expecting. Um, that really makes it so that they have four melee, which is not something you normally want to pick into Jaina. But maybe they're hoping that the Zera tool will provide a good counter to Jaina, go and blow the Jaina up and that they will just have a lot of initiation with Falstead, ETC, Karzim, and Zeratul. Uh, if I were late night fogies right now, I don't know what the proper response is. Because on the one hand, you could pick up a second support. Uh, once again, that would mean that you have fairly low damage, but it would help you keep the Jaina alive. But at the same time, a Medivh. Now, that is interesting. That's actually something I was kind of thinking of, is because Medivh is one of those few heroes right now, Karzim actually being one of which, where they're really kind of in between. Um... Medivh is a specialist, but he's kind of a support assassin. His, he has supports with his portals, support ability with his uh, shield, but he can still output a lot of damage if you manage to get Master's Touch stacked, um, which is that level 7 talent. Uh, he can rival a lot of assassins in DPS if you manage to stack that pretty early on. Uh, so I actually really like the Medivh pick here. I think that helps to mitigate some of the problems that they might have had. I also want to point out that it looks like a... I don't remember if they did it for the game or not, but the uh, Late Night Fogies uh, definitely, I don't know if they're going to take this game and take the match, but they definitely win for the Icon Synergy. Nor if you really got to, that's probably why you lost last game, honestly, is that you didn't have all Oni Genji icons lined up to look all pretty. It just shows shows a lack of teamwork. You know? I, I jest, of course, but I do like to see it when teams <laughs> decide to do kind of frivolous things like that and opt for mount or skin or Icon Synergy, just to make a point. So I expect our solo laners to pretty obviously be um, Dehaka solo laning in the top lane, Ragnarok solo laning in the top lane, and the other teams rotating a lot. Now Jaina is going to have to be very careful with Zeratul. Malfurion, despite being a really solid healer, is not a fantastic burst healer. Um, so if Zeratul does manage to get on Jaina, Jaina could have some difficulty. Um, if Jaina decides to go the Ice Barrier talent, which I believe is at level 4, that will help her with that problem. Malfurion does go Scouting Drone. That should allow him to place those all over the map and make it a lot more difficult for Zeratul to get these flanks. Additionally, if Medivh decides to go the Reveal, which I believe is at level 4, that will be another way for them to spot the Zeratul. Uh, it might actually, looking at this uh, kind of like mid-skirmish type deal going on here, it might actually be Falstad that decides to send the top lane instead of Ragnaros, just because he will be able to jump through the top lane. Karazim getting rooted, taking a lot of damage, getting the damage from Diablo, but Karazim is able to jump away with his dash. Uh, looks like Falstad and Dehaka are both coming top lane, so it will be Falstad Dehaka. Well, I may have spoken too soon. Falstad looked like he was rotating up, but he comes back down and looks like they decide to send Ragnaros instead. Um, either one would work. I do like the rag top a little bit better, um, just because it will be easier for Falstad to stack Season Marksman if he is managing to rotate between the two lanes. Uh, and Ragnaros can also clear the way faster than Falstad can, especially considering the Season Marksman instead of Gathering Power. Uh, there was a bit of a fight breaking out down in the bot lane. Uh, North taking a lot of punishment. Zadkiel already showing um, that he's a pretty decent Medivh, uh, that he's managing to get a lot of harass, uh, keep really safe, and just capitalize on them not expecting the portals and getting a lot of damage from uh, his Q. Uh, we see right now that Dehaka currently having to fight the Ragnaros for the shrine. Uh, this early on, I do think uh, Dehaka has a bit of an advantage. I'm not quite sure what the Burrow was about there. Maybe he was expecting the Medivh to fall a little bit earlier. Ragnaros is already low on mana. I imagine 
that Dehaka has some level of trait stacks. Uh, Zeratul being initiated on uh, does have his wound, so he is able to get out. Uh, a good attempt there from Fogit, or excuse me, late night Fogies to kill the Zeratul. Uh, the root does not quite hit, but they do manage to get the shrines. Uh, Ragnaros, however, looks like he will be able to get the top shrine. Actually, no, I am very surprised there, Dehaka. I don't know if he was able to stall it or if they just barely made it in time. An early Dragon Knight going over to Late Night Fogies. Uh, ETC in a lot of trouble, ends up getting punted away by the knight. Uh, it is an early knight, uh, so I'm expecting not a whole lot to actually come from this. Uh, the timer has only got 30 seconds left. Looks like they maybe will go for the front wall here. They might be able to rotate it a little bit more. Uh, this is not a lot of action going on. I want to mention that I am a little surprised that they didn't go for Tychus. Just because Tychus is a good counter to Diablo, they prove that they know how to use it. And something a lot of people don't consider is that on particularly this map and Garden of Terror, that Tychus percent health damage from his trait also applies to the heroic units of the Dragon Knight and the Garden Terror. So uh, having Tychus it wouldn't be as important in the early game, especially in the late game when the Dragon Knight actually starts doing damage. It would have been very helpful for helping to burst down that uh, Dragon Knight. I don't know if it was necessarily... I, like, the comp isn't bad by any means. Having the Falstad for the global to help counter the Dehaka is really helpful. They've decided that they're going to try to use the Zeratul to deal with the Jaina. So it's not a bad comp by any means. But I do wonder if they might have um, second-guessed the Tychus. Or it might be possible that whoever is playing the Falstad um, is also the Tychus player. I apologize. I am not entirely sure as to who was on what last match. Um, and who plays what in a broader sense. So that may be why they chose to not do it. I mean, he's taking a lot of damage, but uh, he does have Malfurion right behind him, and the portal can be able to save him. Uh, real quick, just taking a look at the talents, we don't see anything completely out of the ordinary. Jaina once again going a frost build, build, deciding to go Winter's Reach this time. Uh, we see Devil's Dew. Uh, Devil's Dew is actually an interesting choice on Diablo. I like Devil's Dew a lot, especially when uh, you either don't have like uh, a really powerful support who can keep you topped off. Malfurion is actually does a pretty good job of keeping the Diablo healthy. But having that Devil's Dew, I think a lot of the time is better than it work for landing purposes, because you're not always charging in, so you don't always get the resistant, but getting the extra healing from Devil's Dew is really helpful. Oh, we see level 7's coming out, and it is going to be Master's Touch for... Oh, wow. Uh, it would look like, while I was talking about talents, Dehaka did not see the Shimmer, and that is uh, the first kill of the game, going over to North with the double kill uh, from Wolf. Well, double kills and two people committed the kill. Wolf and Party Boy Cory uh, managing to destroy the Dehaka. He was not expecting it. Uh, Zeratul, uh, looking like he was going for another kill there, ends up getting spotted, but he has his brother and is able to jump out. Uh, Medivh did end up going Dust of Appearance, which will be helpful for trying to spot Zeratul. Uh, it looks like there's a bit of a skirmish going on here. ETC was a little far up, but Undead Human on ETC has done a very good job so far, uh, just knowing what his limits are, never being so far up that he can't get to his team with just a mere power slide. Uh, so the Siege Camp is being picked up by Late Night Bogies. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the bot shrine is getting captured by North, and the top shrine has currently been in, getting captured by Dehaka. I do feel like North has to be careful here just because Dehaka, if he really wanted to, could jump down in the bush and make this a 3v5. It looks like that Zeratul is going for the Dehaka again. Ragnaros, however, took a lot of damage. Zeratul deciding just to rotate mid instead. ETC taking a lot of damage, getting charged by the Diablo. Manages to get the face melt, but looted by Malfurion. A good portal from the Deeb. Is he going to die? Almost barely has any life left for the Malfurion. A uh, ticking heal that was uh, still. Actually, my bad. That is uh, the Karzi heal was enough to get him away. Oh, it was the ETC's uh, guitar solo that was the DOT heal. Anyway, ETC barely manages to live, but despite the fact that he did not die, that is another Dragonite coming out for late night fogies. I'm really not sure what uh, difficulty he's having. They're just not quite getting the rotation. I feel like the Zeratul pick was a good idea for trying to deal with the Jaina, but that it was counter-pricked fairly well through the Medivh choice. And so they're like, all right, we'll go all in, we'll kill the Jaina. That'll make it very easy for us. Jaina was a big threat last game, but uh, the flexibility of late night fogies to pull out the Medivh and prevent Zeratul from getting those sequels and those kills is making it hard on North to get a lot of value. Uh, bot 
fort wall is down, fort itself taking about a fourth, maybe a third of its damage, but they do manage to rotate and take out the rest. Leyline Seal coming in from Medivh. These are going to be, oh, the APOC green combo out of Leyline Seal. My goodness gracious, that's the sort of stuff you see in the pro leagues. Um, I, I must say, maybe I'm embellishing it a bit, but that was really impressive. That was a perfect setup by the Medivh, locking down the three members before they could hit level 10, following up with a stun from the APOC, the damage from Ring of Frost. That is really showing Late Night Fogies just teamwork from the highest order here. Uh, I will say the MVP is still Zad Kiel getting that three-man ley line, seeing the opportunity. And as my understanding, he is the captain, so he's probably the one that called the that whole business. But really, really impressive play coming in from Lord of the Fogies. There's just... You can't even blame North. Like, they, how are they supposed to know that the enemy was going to be able to pull off that ridiculous combo when the three of them were going to try to push them off? So, uh, it's going to be a bit of an uphill battle here uh, from North. They're trying, Zeratul tries to push the wave up, but Dehaka and Diablo are already top of the with it. They're just trying to soak, recover the EXP lead. They do have 10 now. Uh, it, it's, my best guess is that it should be difficult for late night focus to pull that off again uh, just because with deep gust from the Falstad and the dp from zeratul uh, there's two really good ways of um counter engaging there or just disengaging entirely uh three of your people get ley line sealed you just jump to the enemy back line and void prison it um, now everybody's stunned no one's playing the game and you get out of it before they do and are able to either walk away or set up initiation of your own and with gust you see the ley line come down. If you're not in it, you just got to wait enemy teams so they're not in range for them. So, a uh, really opportunistic timing there for late night fogies and their ability to get that uh, three man ley line into the wombo combo of the night. Uh, so, we'll see whether or not they manage to pull it off again. There's a little more pushback coming through from. Uh, ooh, just looking to follow the false death flight there coming up here to clear the bruisers. I was gonna say something, but I'm sure I was just summing up the sentence. I was distracted by my brother in the chat. So we're just gonna pretend like I didn't forget what I was about to say and talk about the game. So, Siege Camp being taken by uh, Late Night Fogies. Uh, right now, everyone's just kind of playing the map. This is one of those phases where I start to get a little irritated with Dragonshire. As I say that, though, Dehaka looks like he might be in trouble. Silence coming out with his isolation, taking a lot of damage. He is going into stasis. The heal is not going to be enough and he does end up going down. Ragnaros is mid lane and able to stop the Medivh from, oh, Medivh going in, good two man silence coming in. Ring of Frost does not quite connect and there is the Gust into VP. I don't know if it was intentional, but it was really cool. Um, so Fear Smash coming down, landing on the Diablo, but they do not have to follow up, unfortunately. ETC trying to get something to happen, but they just are unable to do so. Uh, so good pick coming in from North, managing to kill the Dehaka. Uh, the Ley Line Seal used a little preemptively my Mediv. They try to initiate onto it, but they are unable to kill the Ragnaros. Looks like there might have been a little bit of miscommunication there. The Ring of Frost came down, but Diablo was not quite fast enough to overpower Ragnaros into the ring, instead knocking him out of it and just into the blizzard. Both shrines currently being channeled by Late Night Fogies. Uh, Falstad or somebody has got to get to a shrine and get it, but unfortunately for them, there is currently a siege camp, although it's almost dead. Pushing bot lane, the took a lot of damage trying to clear. Really needed someone like Ragnaros or Falstad there to try to do it. ETC taking a lot of punishment, does have a godlight available, and gets out before the roof goes down. Now, this is something that might be a bit of a problem for North going into the game is that unless Karazim opts for the talent at level 16, uh, they do not have a flinch. And so there's a lot of potential through the Oblo shenanigans. Jaina slows and maybe a root if she chooses that option with her E, uh, the Malfurion roots and the Dehaka Dragon isolation uh, that someone could just get a completely wombo combo with CC. Uh, ETC doing a really good job here of uh, just preventing the enemy <coughs> from being able to turn in. Uh, he is uh, doing a good job of harass, but the APOC comes down. Uh, not quite, once again, this is what we're talking about. They're not quite the same synergy. Leyline and APOC pet at the same time instead of in sequence, and the Gust is there. The Aka almost gets the channel out, but really both teams, I feel like, are having a bit of a difficulty here communicating. The BP and the Sultan's at the same time. Now, Fury and Twilight Dream coming down, but the Jaina Ring of Frost is on point yet again. Jaina Ring of Frost, man, this big beard here just knows his Ring of Frost. Every single one I've seen hits at least two people, one if the enemy team is lucky. 
And so they do manage to secure two kills, one on the ETC, one on the cars, and you get the Dragon Knife. This is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, you try to push somewhere with Dragon Knife, Ragnaros turns into a big bad boss, and you just can't do much about it. It looks like they are going to resign themselves to taking out this final board instead. Uh, top four was already pretty much dead. Not an amazing use of the Dragon Knife, but they're getting what they can. Uh, Falstad, Zeratul, and Ragnaros rotating up to try to apply some pressure here. Ragnaros is going to get punted to mid lane, hey, but not a lot is going to happen. It looks like they're going to try to push down this fort yet again now that Ragnaros is moving. The fort is down. GTC applying some pressure, and the rest of the team is currently just now catching up. Team of Frost is down for another 20 seconds. A lot of pressure going onto Wolf. He is very low right now. Secure so Smash coming down onto Mazi. Uh, not quite enough damage where they just don't seem to have the follow through. Uh, good Gust coming from Falstad, making sure his team remains safe. Ragnaros gets punted over the wall. It looks like that late night cookies might still have enough damage to knock down the sport, and they do. Uh, Dragonite has a measly second left on its lifespan. It is going to explode. Another Leyline Seal coming in. What's going to happen? Apoc into Ring of Frost. They do it again. One kill on the ETC. Second kill on the Ragnaros. Third kill. Oh, not quite. Karzine Duck managed to jump away. It looks like they uh, do have an idea what they want with that combo. Uh, they, I don't know if they practiced it or they just have that good teamwork because they managed to land the Leyline into Apoc into Ring of Frost once again, uh, getting two kills off of it. And not enough to really push for any important objectives. Looks like they're going to steal this Bruiser camp, but you do notice that this is turning into a very large XP lead for Late Night Fogies. Combination of being five kills up and uh, the uh, structural advantage having taken down all three forts, while unfortunately um, North has not been able to take one yet. Uh, really impressive play coming in from Late Night Fogies. North is doing the best they can. I like what they tried to do. They tried to counter pick the Wombo combo by having the Void Prison, by having the Mighty Gust, even though it was something that happened after the fact, the comp was in a position where it could potentially deal with these sorts of things, but they are really just not quite able to maintain positioning that allows them to get out of that at all points in time. Uh, the Medivh player, um, Zadkiel, just doing a really good job of just holding that Leyline Seal until he can hit three to four people with it. It just allows for an easy follow-up for his team. Initiation coming in from Late Night Fogies. Another Leyline coming in, hitting two people. Ring of Frost is available. Instead, it's just the route that comes down from Malfury, and they decide not to go for it this time around. Apoc is still not available. A lot of uh, portal shenanigans coming in. They're really just pressuring here. We do notice that North needs to be careful. They still don't have to see them. They're probably going to come down. Uh, Leyline Seal is not up. So, oh, good drag coming in on Zeratul. Uh, smart play from Zeratul, however, uh, moving away from where the river falls so that he is able to blink over and to safety. But once again, like, no one on North here is misplaying. Uh, it's just the Wombo is just proving a little too much to handle, even with the tools to disengage from it, being Void Prison and... Uh, Gus, uh, Ragnaros decides that he is going to pressure it. Uh, Secure's match comes down, doing some decent damage to the back line. They're trying to make sure this game is not taken, driving off the enemy until they can hit 16. But we are seeing the power of Dehaka here as he is able to move all the way from bot lane to top lane to grab this shrine as Medivh and Diablo rotate in. I don't know if, okay, uh, ETC stage dive comes in. Uh, it looks like it's currently a 4v4, neither Rag or Dehaka are at the by Arzing taking a lot of pressure. Apoc going down, but does not hit anybody. Good VP catching three members. Will they be able to follow up? Sulfura Smash is not available. They're not really offering to do so. The Apple Shadow Card is out here. A lot of uh, set aside for up with Karzine, but in the back line, we see the, oh, there is the Leyline Seal. It's almost killed, but he doesn't get the tap. Gust going to push away the members of Late Night Fogies, but at the cost of his own life. It is currently a 3v4, down two levels. It's unlikely that they will be able to stop this from happening. So Fury Smash is finally off two rounds, doing a lot of damage with Mount Fury. He's able to heal up his team. There is another death with going down, Karzine getting manhandled, we see the portal coming in from Medivh, getting it so that Karzine does not have an escape path, barely has any life left, the Medivh auto attack coming in, it's only Rag left alive, it does look like he will be able to escape, uh, really unfortunate there for North, they really look like they had the potential to turn that fight 
uh, but they just did not quite have it. I do wonder if Ragnaros had been a little more conservative with the Sulfurous Smith when they were trying to depush the bot line. If that might have been enough to change the tides, maybe it wouldn't have been. We're seeing a lot of really solid play coming in from late night fogies, and uh, especially the Jango. Like, all of those Ring of Frost have been absolutely great. This person probably plays Jango better than I do, and I'm master. Uh, but we see here Wolf getting a little out of position, but he is there. Tool does have the blink and is able to escape. Meanwhile, the Kindo in the Dragon Eye just hacking away the keep, just axe after axe. Uh, I wonder what they're going to try to do with this. They almost have 20. If they take down this tower, they will probably have it. If they were greedy, they could potentially end it here. It looks like they're just going to go for the other bottom keep instead. They, however, have not pushed the wave in. So as soon as this Dragon Eye goes down, they won't have anything else to stop it. BP goes down to prevent them from attacking. The keep, the Dragon Knight is exploded when the health runs out. Uh, I would be careful if I were North here. You really don't want to go for some location while you have Void Prison down, even though Isolation is down for Dehaka as well. They do have the Wombo combo available, and you are currently down level 20. Uh, probably a little over eager here with the Ragnaros going to protect the keep. Um, I understand what he's trying to do, trying to poke, trying to apply pressure, see where the enemy is, make sure that they're not going to push in on the keep. Um, but I would really wait until a little bit longer before it was pretty apparent that they were committing to either Oh, we see it. Oh, goodness. Falstad and UTC going pretty aggressive. A good route coming from Alfurion, followed by the drag from Dehaka and the Apocalypse from Diablo. And they are blown to smithereens. This is exactly what I'm talking about here, where the Ragnaros might have been able to help the him a little bit better if he held on to that Molten Core. Uh, I understand what he's trying to do, but I do feel like it's this time he's a little bit overzealous. He knows what he needs to do. He just needs to hold that button a little bit longer. We see UTC going in with Diablo. A good ultimate coming out from... Uh, Nadeev getting the lockdown on the ETC. Uh, APOC coming down. Actually, I believe that was just the Hellgate activation. Um, so it looks like this is going to be another game in favor of late night bogeys. The Keep is taking a lot of damage. Uh, Ragnaros is doing the best he can to just apply that AoE damage from Sophia Smash. Doing his best to kill him. Does manage to get one kill. Gets the second kill on Diablo. Uh, the Keep. Oh, oh wow. Amazing. Karzim is able to kill Zag Kill at the last minute. Uh, Falstag comes in with the gust. It does look like they will live to die another day. Mongoose, however, taking a lot of damage. They are unable to kill the catapult. I spoke too soon. Falstag does push the Jaina and the Malfurion away, but it is not enough with the catapult pelting core and just the amount of damage and sustainability. It is not enough for Falstag alone. Very valiant last effort there from North to try to prevent uh, late night fogies from taking the game, but. The teamwork coming in from Late Night Fogies was just too much to handle. Just the constant wombo combos, the amazing Medivh play, the on-point Ring of Frost and APOC combos. Once again, the end there. Amazing job by Party Boy Cord killing two members while being 1v5 basically. Karzine taking out Medivh before he dies as well. Almost were able to give them a second chance, but it just wasn't quite enough. The level difference was too much, and the set is indeed taken by the late night fogies so that is going to be the set uh, amazing games by both teams i really was impressed um, I, those of you who are watching the stream don't know there were some concerns as to whether or not uh, some of the players were going to be able to make it tonight. They did manage to make it. I'm really happy about that. I know the players are happy about that as well. So just congratulations to both teams on those games. Really fantastic games to watch and even more enjoyable to cast. So I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. If you want to watch the replay while well, you're watching what you're watching right now, this probably won't be very helpful to people, but I'm going to say it anyway. Replays are going to be available on twitch.tv slash If you want to share it with your friends, maybe if you're one of the team members and you... Uh, or maybe you're a sub or something like that, you want to see how your team did, maybe you want to analyze your own play, or just see what nonsense I'm spouting, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, I have been Verdestrom. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Amazing games from both teams, and see you next time.